the problem of types in poetry carl spitteler's prometheus and epimetheus by carl gustav young eighteen seventy five to nineteen sixty one from psychological types or the psychology of individuation this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. If among the themes offered to the poet by the intricacies of emotional life, the problem of types did not play a significant role, it would practically prove that such a problem did not exist. But we have already seen how in Schiller this problem stirred the poet in him as deeply as the thinker in this chapter we shall turn our attention to a poetic work which is almost exclusively based on the motif of the type problem i refer to karl spitteler's prometheus and epimetheus which first appeared in eighteen eighty one i have no wish to explain at the outset that prometheus the forethinker stands for the introvert while epimetheus the man of action and afterthinker signifies the extrovert in the conflict of these two figures the principal issue is the battle of the introverted with the extroverted line of development in one and the same individual though the poetic presentation has embodied the conflict in two independent figures with their typical destinies it is self-evident that prometheus exhibits introverted character traits he presents the picture of a man faithfully introverted to his inner world true to his soul his reply to the angel is a telling expression of his nature yet it is not mine to judge my soul's appearance for behold my mistress she is my god in joy and sorrow and whatsoever i am i have from her alone and so with her will i share my glory and if need be boldly will i renounce it footnote prometheus and epimetheus dietrich's edition nineteen twenty page nine and footnote in this act prometheus surrenders himself unconditionally to his own soul i e to the function of relation to the inner world hence the soul has also a mysterious metaphysical character precisely on account of its relation to the unconscious prometheus concedes it absolute significance as mistress and guide in the same unconditional manner in which epimetheus yields himself to the world he sacrifices his individual ego to the soul to the relation with the unconscious as the mother womb of eternal images and meanings he thereby surrenders the self since he loses the counterweight of the persona i e the relation to the external object with this surrender to his soul prometheus drops away from every connection with the surrounding world thus escaping the indispensable correction gained through external reality but this loss is irreconcilable with the nature of this world therefore an angel appears to prometheus clearly a representative of world government expressed psychologically he is the projected image of a tendency directed towards reality adaptation the angel accordingly says to prometheus it shall come to pass if thou dost not prevail and free thyself from thy soul's unrighteous way that the great reward of many years and thy heart's content and all the fruits of thy subtle mind shall be lost unto thee and in another place rejected shall thou be on the day of glory for the sake of thy soul who knoweth no god and heedeth no law for to her arrogance nothing is holy neither in heaven nor upon earth 
because prometheus has a one-sided orientation to his soul every impulse towards adaptation to the outer world tends to be repressed and to sink into the unconscious consequently if perceived at all they appear as separate from the individuality hence as projections in this connection it would seem that there is a certain contradiction in the fact that the soul whose cause prometheus has espoused and which he as it were accepted in full consciousness appears as a projection since the soul like the persona is a function of relationship it must consist in a certain sense of two parts one part belonging to the individuality and the other adhering to the object of relationship in this case the unconscious one is indeed generally inclined unless one is a frank adherent to the hartmann philosophy to grant the unconscious only the relative existence of a psychological factor on the grounds of the theory of cognition we are as yet quite unable to make any valid statement with regard to an objective reality of the phenomenal psychological complex which we term the unconscious just as we are equally powerless to determine anything valid about the nature of real things which lie beyond our psychological capacity on the ground of experience i must however point out that in relation to our conscious activity the contents of the unconscious make the same claim to reality by virtue of their obstinacy and persistence as do the real things of the outer world even when this challenge appears very improbable to a mentality with a preferential bias towards external reality it must not be forgotten that there have always been many for whom the contents of the unconscious possessed a greater reality than the things of the outer world the history of human thought bears witness to both realities a more searching investigation of the human psyche shows unquestionably that there is on the whole an equally strong influence from both sides upon conscious activity so that psychologically we have a right on purely empirical grounds to treat the contents of the unconscious as just as real as the things of the outer world albeit these two realities may be mutually contradictory and appear entirely different in their natures but to subordinate one reality over the other would be an altogether unjustifiable presumption theosophy and spiritualism are no better than materialism in their outrageous encroachments upon reality we have in fact to resign ourselves to the sphere of our psychological possibilities the peculiar reality of unconscious contents therefore gives us the same right to describe these as objects as the things of the outer world whereas the persona considered as a relation is always conditioned by the outer object and hence is as firmly anchored in the outer object as it is in the subject the soul as a relation to the inner object is similarly represented by the inner object in a sense therefore it is always distinct from the subject and is actually perceptible as something distinct hence it appears to prometheus as something quite separate from his individual ego in the same way as a man who yields himself entirely to the outer world still has the world as an object distinct from himself so the unconscious world of images remains as an object distinct from the subject even when a man is wholly surrendered to it just as the unconscious world of mythological images speaks indirectly through the experience of external things to the man who abandons himself to the outer world so the real world and its claims find their way indirectly to the man who has surrendered himself to the soul for no man can escape both realities 
if a man is fixed upon the outer reality he must live his myth if he is turned towards the inner reality then must he dream his outer his so-called real life thus the soul says to prometheus a god of crime am i who leadeth thee astray upon untrodden paths but thou wouldest not hearken unto me and now hath it come to pass according to my words for my sake have they robbed thee of the glory of thy name and stolen from thee thy life's content footnote prometheus and epimetheus pages twenty four and following and footnote prometheus refuses the kingdom the angel offers him which means that he refuses adaptation to things as they are because his soul is demanded from him in exchange while the subject i e prometheus is essentially human the soul is of quite a different character it is demonic because the inner object namely the suprapersonal collective unconscious to which it is attached as the function of relation gleams through it the unconscious regarded as the historical background of the psyche contains in a concentrated form the entire succession of engrams imprints which from time immemorial have determined the psychic structure as it now exists these engrams may be regarded as function traces which typify on the average the most frequently and intensely used functions of the human soul these function engrams present themselves in the form of mythological themes and images appearing often in identical form and always with striking similarity among all races they can also be easily verified in the unconscious material of modern man it is intelligible therefore that avowedly animal traits or elements should also appear among the unconscious contents by the side of those sublime figures which from oldest times have accompanied man on the road of life the unconscious disposes of a whole world of images whose boundless range yields in nothing to the claims of the world of real things to the one who personally surrenders himself wholly to the outer world the unconscious comes in the form of some intimate and beloved being in whom should his destiny lie in extreme devotion to the personal object he will experience the duality of the world and his own nature in like manner there comes to the other a demonic personification of the unconscious embodying the totality the extreme oppositeness and duality of the world of images these are borderline phenomena which overstep the normal hence the normal mind knows nothing of these cruel enigmas they do not exist for him it is always only the few who reach the rim of the world where its mirage begins for the man who stands always upon the normal path the soul has a human and not a dubious demonic character neither do his fellow men appear to him in the least problematical only complete abandonment either to one world or to the other evokes their duality spittler's intuition caught that picture of the soul which in a less profound nature would at most have found utterance in dreams accordingly we read page twenty five and while he thus demeaned himself in the fury of his passion there played a strange quiver about her mouth and face and ever and again her eyelids flickered shutting and opening hastily and behind the soft delicate fringe of her lashes there lurked something which threatened and crept about like the fire which glided stealthily through the house or like the tiger stealing among the bushes while from the dark foliage in broken flashes gleameth ever and anon his yellow mottled flanks 
the line of life which prometheus chooses is thus unmistakably introverted he sacrifices all connection with the present in order to create in anticipation the distant future it is very different with epimetheus he realizes that his aim is the world and what the world values hence he says to the angel yet now i long for truth and my soul lieth in thy hand and it please thee therefore give me a conscience that will teach me shun and ness and every just precept epimetheus cannot resist the temptation to fulfil his own destiny and submit himself to the soulless point of view this junction with the world is immediately rewarded and it came to pass as epimetheus rose up that he felt his stature was increased and his courage more steadfast he was at one with all his being and his whole feeling was sound and mightily at ease and thus he strode with bold steps through the valley on a straight course as one who feareth no man and with a bold glance like a man inspired by the contemplation of his own riches he has as prometheus says bartered his free soul for shun and ness the soul is lost to him in favour of his brother he has followed his extraversion and because this orientates him towards the external object he is caught up in the desires and expectations of the world seemingly at first to his great advantage he has become an extrovert after having lived many solitary years under the influence of his brother as an extrovert falsified through imitation of the introvert such involuntary simulation dans le caractère footnote paul Hahn, end footnote occurs not infrequently his conversion to true extroversion is therefore a step towards truth and deservedly brings him a partial reward whilst prometheus through the tyrannical claims of his soul is hampered in every relation to the external object and has to make the cruelest sacrifices in the service of the soul epimetheus receives an immediately effective shield against the danger that most threatens the extrovert viz a complete surrender to the external object this protection consists in the conscience which is based upon traditional right ideas and which therefore possesses that not to be despised treasure of inherited worldly wisdom which is employed by public opinion in much the same fashion as the judge uses the penal code this provides epimetheus with a circumscribed code which restrains him from abandoning himself to objects in the same degree as prometheus does to his soul this is forbidden him by the conscience which stands in the place of his soul when prometheus turns his back upon the world of men and its codified conscience he falls into the hands of his cruel soul mistress with her arbitrary power and only through endless suffering does he make expiation for his neglect of the world the prudent restraint of a blameless conscience sets such a bandage over prometheus's eyes that he must blindly live his myth but ever with a sense of doing right since he dwells in constant harmony with general expectation with success ever at his side since he fulfils the wishes of all thus men desire to see the king and thus epimetheus plays his part to the inglorious end never forsaken by the strong backing of public approval his self-assurance and self-righteousness his unshakable confidence in his general worth his unquestionable right doing and good conscience present an easily recognizable portrait of that extroverted character which jordan depicted 
compare page 102 and the following pages describing the visit of epimetheus to the sick prometheus where king epimetheus is anxious to heal his suffering brother and when all was duly accomplished the king stepped forth and supported by a friend on the left hand and on the right he lifted up his voice in greeting and spake these well-intentioned words my heart grieveth me on thy account prometheus my beloved brother but now take heart for behold i have here a salve of virtue for every ill wondrous is its healing power both in heat and in frost and thou mayest use it alike to comfort or chastise thyself and speaking thus he took his staff and bound the salve fast and proffered it to him all wearily with weighty mien but hardly had prometheus perceived the odour and aspect of the ointment than he turned his head away with disgust whereupon the king changed the tone of his voice and began to cry aloud and to prophesy with great heat of a truth it seemeth thou hast need of greater punishment since thy present fate does not suffice to teach thee and speaking thus he drew a mirror from his cloak and declared unto him all things from the beginning and became very eloquent and knew all his faults the words of jordan are speakingly illustrated in this scene society must be pleased if possible if it will not be pleased it must be astonished if it will neither be pleased nor astonished it must be pestered and shocked in the above scene we find almost the same climax in the orient a rich man makes known his rank by never showing himself in public unless supported by two slaves epimetheus affects this pose in order to make an impression well doing must at the same time be combined with admonition and moral discourse and as that does not produce an effect the other must at least be horrified by the picture of his own baseness thus everything is aimed towards making an impression there is an american saying which runs in america two sorts of men make good the man who can do something and the man who can bluff well which means that pretense is sometimes just as successful as actual performance an extrovert of this kind preferably makes his effect by appearance the introvert tries to force the situation and to this end may even abuse his work if we fuse prometheus and epimetheus into one personality we should have a man outwardly epimethean and inwardly promethean an individual constantly torn by both tendencies each seeking to enlist the ego finally on its side End of the Problem of Types in Poetry Carl Spittler's Prometheus and Epimetheus by Carl Gustav Jung, 1875-1961 Published in 1923